Business Week Club. We're going to continue talking with Rob Skiba today, author of two books, creator, writer, producer of the forthcoming digital web series called Seed, multiple telly award-winning filmmaker, and a whole lot more. He's going to be making actually three DVDs for the Prophecy Club. Mythology, UFOs, and Strong Delusions, Saturday afternoon, 2 to 5. That evening, 7 to 10.30, is The Rise of Babylon, 322 Tetrads, and The Time of Jacob's Trouble. Then the next morning, Sunday morning, beginning at 9.30, going to be 2.45, The Year Man Becomes Immortal. Rob, you were just talking about mythology and how it relates to the Bible. Continue, please. Sure. Why did I even get started in thinking about mythology in the first place is kind of interesting because... Anybody who's seen some of the trends that are happening in movies these days, they're making a lot of movies about gods and superheroes and stuff. And there were three movies that came out sort of one after the other that I actually enjoyed all of them. Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief, followed by Clash of the Titans, followed by Thor. And it was after seeing Thor for the second time, because again, I enjoyed these movies. I liked seeing these movies. But I was frustrated because these three movies, and others like them, have the same exact theme the same plot the son of god saves the world the problem is it's the wrong son of the wrong god you got the son of poseidon the son of zeus and son of odin respectively with these three movies and i came out i'm like lord i'm so frustrated because these movies are made for hundreds of millions of dollars they gross billions of dollars and the theme of the movie is the son of god saves the world but it's the wrong son of the wrong god I was really frustrated by it, and the Lord clearly spoke to me and said, you have got to become as good at telling the truth as they are at telling lies. And I was like, whoa, okay, what does that mean? (laughs) So I started thinking about some stuff, and of course I'm thinking about these mythological gods and stuff like that, and the Lord essentially brought me to the Ten Commandments. And it, it starts off with, thou shalt have no other gods before me. I guess I never really thought about it much. I mean, like, who are these other gods, and why is God so concerned with them? You know, I mean, he's not worried about them for his, for his own sake. They're nothing to him. But he's worried about them for our sake, because if you read the Bible, you see that Israel was constantly whoring after these other gods. They were leaving the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and going after these guys. But you have to reckon with who are these guys that they're going after. And so I, you know, it kind of forced me to take a, a deeper look at it. And as a result, I came across a couple of books that really inspired me. One was a book by Dr. Ken Johnson called Ancient Post-Flood History, and another by a guy named King Wells called Ancient Myths in the Bible. And there's something in Ancient Myths of the Bible that really caught my attention. King Wells is the author of this book. He says, we should look at the Bible from a mythological worldview. He suggests that we do that. And uh, now, that sounds weird to somebody like me who comes from a hardcore Christian background studying the Word my whole life, because we're taught that we should look at everything from a biblical worldview. And I'm not disputing that, neither is King Wells. He certainly agrees that we should look at things from a biblical worldview. But what he's suggesting is that when you look at the stories in the Bible, understand that the authors of Scripture, beginning with the Torah, with Moses, were writing at a time when the Sumerian gods were very real to the people of that day. The Babylonian gods were very real. The Egyptian gods were very real. In fact, we even see in Scripture that God went to war with the gods of Egypt. Uh, uh, So you're like, what? Huh? Whoa, 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 wait, wait, back up. What, What are we talking about here? And when you even get to the New Testament, you see that the apostles, right? They're out there, and they thought that that Barnabas was Zeus and that uh, Paul was Mercury or Hermes, messenger of the gods. So what he's saying is, again, the authors of Scripture were writing at a time when the Sumerian, Babylonian, Egyptian, Greek gods were very real to the people of those days. And when you understand that the Scriptures were written at a time when that was a very real paradigm, we just look at it now as, you know, something we read in history class, you know, or or literature class, you know, the Odyssey and the Iliad. These are just myths and fables. Well, that's what we read now, but at that time... Clearly, it was very real to those people. So uh, if it's important enough for the Holy Spirit to inspire the authors of Scripture to include these things and to write about these things and to make us aware of these things, then I figure, well, we probably should understand it better than we do, because I've never heard anybody preach about it. Nobody that, that I've ever listened to has ever preached about it. So I thought, well, I will. So <laughs> started looking into it. And so we started to have to figure out, well, what is the origin of these gods? Now, I certainly believe that many of them may be fallen angels masquerading. I I certainly believe that. But there are other ways we can look at this, and that's where one of the other books I brought up uh, comes into play, where ancient post-flood history 
Dr. Ken Johnson points out the longevity of the pre-flood patriarchs. You know, when you look and see how long these guys live, you know, Adam lives, what, 930 years, something like that. They keep going, Methuselah, 969 years, right? Noah, 950 years. And he points out, it's like, well, okay, look at Noah. Noah lived 950 years, right? 600 years before the flood and 350 years after the flood. And the next generation, his son, like Shem, lives to about 500 years of age. You know, so that generation lives between roughly four and 500 and a little bit more uh, beyond 500 years of age. But by the time you get to Abraham's generation, Abraham's generation only lived to be about 200 years of age. And of course, by the time you get to Moses, it's 120 years. And then David writes in Psalm 90 that, you know, our days are 70 years, 80 if by strength. So he says, now imagine this. You're in the generation of Abraham where you're living barely 200 years. But Shem's generation is still hanging around. You know, Shem overlaps Abraham's generation. And actually Noah did a little bit into Abraham's generation as well. And so if you're of the generation that dies, you become old and die by 200. But yet there's a generation above you that's twice that and still kicking. You might think these guys are immortal. You know, you're like, man, look at these guys. You know, something's wrong with me. These guys are immortals. And the guys above them that are, you know, have been around forever you might start thinking of them as gods. And if you were of the generation where, you know, three or four generations down from you, they're looking at you thinking you're a god, what's that going to do to the human ego? You know, I mean, they already have the benefit of the longevity. They have, and it, there's every indication that they lived healthy and strong until they died. I mean, Moses was strong enough to climb a mountain at 120 and you have the added benefit of having lived for 500 years. How much accumulated knowledge did you have? And if you're of Shem's generation, you had the added benefit of hanging around with people like Noah, who lived in the pre-flood world, who overlapped people like Methuselah, you know, who overlapped with Seth. And, you know, you see all the overlaps of people and the accumulated knowledge that goes all the way back to Adam. That, yeah, the generation of Shem... It was in Noah's generation, you know, Noah was the last of that generation, but Shem's generation, Shem, Hem, and Japheth, lived in the 500s. Sure, they could have gotten to the point where they thought of themselves as gods as well. And if you start looking through some of these lineages, specifically Japheth and Ham, you see indications that that may be true, that they did start thinking of themselves as gods and, and their, their offspring did as well. So Ken Johnson makes a case uh, that I believe supports Genesis 6-4, which says that the Nephilim in the pre-flood world, who were the offspring of angels that made with humans, these were the great men of renown, the heroes of old. Uh, we might think of as like Kronos, for instance, who was a titan. And many scholars believe, as I do, that the first generation Nephilim were the equivalent of the Greek titans. You know, we could talk more about that if you'd like. But Well, let me it, just toss one thing in there where it says mighty men of old, men of renown. If you look up that word in the Hebrew, that word old, it is eternal. These giants that were offspring of the sons of God mating with the daughters of men apparently did not inherit the curse of Adam's gene and were living forever. Another reason God had to destroy them. That's definitely one way to look at it. Olam is a very intriguing word. It's translated as forever and everlasting, like uh, I forget how many times, like a hundred and something times, respectively each. So yeah, one way to look at it is the way you just did, and also that when Moses is writing about this 800 plus years after the flood, he's referring to the ancient time before the flood, so long ago that it's almost everlasting in our minds, but it's ancient either way. These guys were around and... They were the offspring of angels, and so, yeah, I mean, you can see where all of, the, and, you know, clearly they had size. They were gargantuan size or huge, and some of the tales of these guys show that they had other abilities and incredible wisdom and, and knowledge and understanding of the universe and physics and stuff like that. So, uh, What it, other abilities? Is it a lot of what we see in the Superman and the, the, yeah. the, the Spider-Man yeah. and stuff like that today? Sure. I, I think that's all just repackaged Genesis 6, basically, for the 21st century. Uh, I don't know that these guys had the ability to fly like Superman, but there is definitely evidence in the ancient record that there were flying machines. Uh, you look at hieroglyphs and stuff, uh, well, in e Egypt, that shows what looks like airplanes and spaceships. And, you know, uh, same thing in, the, in South uh, America. You see different depictions that looks like, you know, Quetzalcoatl sitting in a spaceship. And th different cultures all around the world have depicted things that look like look like astronauts, they're little figurines that look like they have astronauts. Now, this is where 
Zachariah Sitchin and Eric Von Daniken got their claim to fame, basically. They point all these things out. I don't agree with their conclusions, but the evidence is there. I come to a different conclusion than they do. But, I mean, the History Channel has had a successful run of the Ancient Aliens series for three or four seasons now because this stuff is very intriguing and this evidence is out there. And just as a side note regarding that, another reason why I'm doing what I'm doing is because a friend of mine went to Bible college and uh, had graduated Bible college and was about ready to start his own Bible school when he watched season one of the Ancient Aliens series. And he knew that I was into this research and stuff, so he called me up. And I don't want to say he was shaken in his faith. That would be a little bit too strong to say. But he was pretty shook up. And he said, Rob, I mean, from a biblical worldview and from what we understand of the scriptures, what do we do with this stuff? He says, you know, I mean, the evidence is there. So we're supposed to have a ready defense, you know. How do we deal with this? What, what, what do we, from a biblical worldview, have to say about this stuff? And I thought, wow, here's a guy that just graduated Bible college, about ready to start his own college, uh, and he doesn't have an answer to this stuff. You know, that's a problem because the devil's putting out his answers on a regular basis in movies, pop culture, TV shows, documentaries, History Channel, you know, all that stuff. And Christians are completely silent about it. I mean, there's a few people out there talking about it, but very few. So, you know, in marketing, they say find a need and fill it. Well, there's a huge need. So tell us about <laughs> mythology. Yeah, so I decide, well, I'm going to try to fill the need there. And when we talk about the mythologies and look at the overlaps of the lifespans, that's one way we can think of how human beings began to be viewed as gods. And that's actually a philosophy called euhemerism. Euhemerism is, is a theory attributing the origin of the gods to the deification, essentially, of historical heroes that were humans. We'll be right back after this message. In the Rob Skiba gift offer, his first DVD is Mythology, UFOs, and the Coming Great Deception. Topics are the origin of mythology and the gods, Sumerian, Egyptian, and Greek pantheons, the Coming Great Deception, UFOs and aliens, Nimrod and the Tower of Babel, interdimensional portals, transhumanism, and the quest to be like gods, Giants and Hybrids, Paganism in Washington, D.C., America's Date with Destiny, and in Babylon Rising, 322 Tetrads and the Time of Jacob's Trouble. The topics are The Signs in the Heavens, Babylon in the Last Days, New World Order Conspiracies, Secret Societies, and the Occult's Obsession with the Numbers 322 Tetrads or Blood Red Moons in the Eclipses in the Days Ahead. Jesus coming as a thief in the night, the feasts of God and how they relate to the last days, the tribulation survival plan, and 2045, the year man becomes immortal. Topics will be Genesis 6, Nephilim, hybrid humans, war with hybrids, hybrids among us, the injection of immortality, all three DVDs valued at $90, available for a gift of just $50 at prophecyclub.com. And Rob will be speaking Saturday afternoon, July the 20th from 2 to 5 p.m. and 7 to 10.30 p.m. And then Sunday morning beginning at 9.30 on those three DVDs. And that's on the corner of Park and K in Plano, 2540K Avenue in Plano. The Prophecy Club is having a summer blowout. You get six DVDs of your choice valued at $180 for a gift of $100. Not available on the internet. You gotta call 785-266-1112 to place your order. That's six Prophecy Club DVDs for a gift of $100. Call 785-266-1112. Get yourself informed. Don't let the tricks of the devil deceive you. Get six DVDs for a gift of $100. Call 785-266-1112. And now, back to the program. Historical heroes that were humans. And that was that phrase or that theory was coined by an individual named Euhemerus in about 300 BC. He was a, a Greek philosopher. And uh, Clement of Alexandria, writing about circa 150, 215, somewhere around there, had written something similar. He said, Those to whom you bow, meaning the pagan gods, were once men like yourselves. And uh, Moses seems to agree with that as well w regarding the great men of renown, the heroes of old, likening them to the human hybrid offspring. Genesis 6 experiment is what I call it, what happened in Genesis 6. That is essentially what I believe is the origin where the gods come from. Now, later throughout the centuries, you get a lot of embellishment where different poets and writers and stuff will latch on to some of these characters that probably did have some basis of truth to them 
and then really elaborated on them and embellished on them. One of the, mo the most ancient of all of them is the Epic of Gilgamesh, which most scholars recognize and agree. In fact, I've got a book called Mythology, uh, Myths from Mesopotamia by Oxford World Press, translated by Stephanie Daly. And she points out in the introduction of the book that a lot of these myths, what would happen is there was a real character that some of these stories would develop out of these characters in their lives. But orators would be hired by kings. You know, a king would look for the Shakespeare of the day. And when they went on a long journey, they didn't have the in-flight movie that we have when we go on a long flight, you know. So they would hire a good orator to be the storyteller when they would camp. You know, they finished their march wherever they're going and set up camp uh, as their entertainment. And so what these orators would do is basically knowing their audience, a good orator always knows his audience, would embellish the story based on the king that he was with, the people that he was with, the country that he was in, and you know, add a little twists and stuff to the story. That's why you find so many variants on these myths. You can pick any of the ancient gods, you're going to find numerous different variant stories about them and histories of, of them. And Epic of Gilgamesh was no different. Epic of Gilgamesh was essentially the 3000 BC blockbuster movie of the day. You know, It would just be embellished. But I believe... Gilgamesh himself, the original character, actually traces back to a biblical character named Nimrod. And what I found very intriguing was that many of the ancient gods actually trace back to Nimrod, both in the Sumerian Babylonian myths as well as the Egyptian myths and, of course, the Greek myths uh, were later. The Greeks just stole from everybody else. Okay, really, tell us a little bit about Nimrod and how he fits in here. I mean, I know, but they need to know, too. Sure. Well... We've got a story about Nimrod that's very interesting, beginning in Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 and 9, where it says that Nimrod began to become a mighty one in the earth, what King James talks about. The Septuagint actually says Nimrod began to become a giant in the earth. The reason why the Septuagint tra translated as giant and the King James translated as mighty man is because the word gigantus comes from the Hebrew word gaborim. Now, Gaborim is one of those words you really have to take in context of how it's being used. Because David had mighty men too, but they were not Nephilim. They were not giants. They were busy killing giants. But the authors of the Septuagint understood the difference. That's why when they saw the Hebrew word Gaborim associated with David's mighty men, they translated it as, in Greek, ton dinaton or ton dinatos, which basically means strong, courageous, valiant, mighty warriors. However, when it came to the use of Gaborim with Nimrod in Genesis 10, 8, and 9, they translated Gaborim, the same Hebrew word, as gigantus, which is where we, of course, get words like giant and gigantic. The same word that they use for giant in Genesis 6, 4. So they understood something about Nimrod, you know, being Hebrew scholars, knowing their Hebrew scriptures, translating it into Greek. They understood something such that they translated that same Hebrew word, Giborim as Gigantus, saying that Nimrod began to become a giant, which is very interesting. And the Hebrew word began is chalal, or kalal, I forget how you pronounce it, but it essentially means profaning oneself or defiling oneself, and it has a sexual connotation to it. So something took place in Genesis 10, 8, and 9, where it says that Nimrod, through some sort of profaning or defiling of himself sexually or whatever, he began to become, essentially, genetically speaking, an offspring of the Nephilim. He became a giant. Now, before you get away from that too far, do you see that the black race may have come someplace having to do with Nimrod? Have you picked up anything about that? No, um, I, there are a lot of people, because this is my take on that. There are a lot of people that really paint a broad stroke over the races. I, I would suggest there's only one race. It's a human race. But we look at races as you know, white, Caucasian, or black or Asian, essentially. You know, we kind of put people in these categories. And people assume that all the white people came from Japheth and all the Asian and Middle Eastern people came from Shem and all black people came from Ham, of which Nimrod was a part of that lineage. Um, and while it is true that for the most part those people can be found in the regions where those three sons settled, they, we got to remember that all three sons came from two people, Noah and his wife. M my wife and I will never have a Chinese child. Uh, let me toss something in here for your consideration. Now, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, I'm going to give a disclaimer right up front. I cannot prove a word of this. This came in, I believe, 1991 
when Leslie and I went on a tour with Ron Wyatt to see Noah's Ark and crossing side of the Red Sea. We went inside the, the Great Pyramid and things like that. While we were eating each night, Ron would sit down and tell us stories. Well, this was one of the stories that evening. On one of the pyramids, he said he found a, a set of very interesting cartouches. And he said the first cartouche showed a pregnant woman. And then the second cartouche showed that they had three berries that they mixed up in a mortar and pestle. And then the next cartouche had the woman eating uh, a mixture of those three berries. Again, she's pregnant. And then the baby came out black. He believed that that's where the black race came from. And he said, and if you understand... And he explained also the, the difference in the nose, the difference in the lips, and he, he did it all from a medical standpoint, all from that. Now, what do you think of that? Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought that up because it showed human intervention causing that to happen. One more thing. Uh, have you ever read or heard of the book Black Like Me? It was in about 1965. A fellow had taken some stuff, and it actually turned his white skin black, and he wrote a book to show that people that have black skin really aren't treated uh, by the white people as good as they should. In other words, the point is chemicals can change our skin different colors from white to black. Absolutely. Michael Jackson did the reverse of that. He turned himself white was that it was human intervention. And I'm glad you brought that up because people, when they hear my full thesis, a lot of times if they're prejudiced or if they happen to be people of color, they become offended thinking, okay, you're saying that black people are Nephilim. And and I'm like, no, no, I'm not. (laughs) I'm not saying that at all. Um, I believe that Noah and his wife were like, exactly alike, and they came from Adam, whose name essentially means red. In the pre-flood world, skin color, first of all, comes from melanin. It is a chemical that is released. That's why when white people go out in the sun, we get tan. Why do we get tan? Because the skin releases a chemical called melanin that protects us from the harmful radiation of the sun. It's a chemical reaction. There would have been no harmful radiation of the sun in the pre-flood world, and that gets in the creation dynamics and the canopy and all that. So pre-flood man was probably more pink than anything. And that means no one his wife would have been the same color, which means that the three sons would have been the same color as they are. You know, we produce after ourselves, you know. However, through human intervention and other things, other factors like adaptation in different climate zones can cause things as well, we can see changes like you just described. Now, what is interesting about Nimrod's father, Cush, uh, is his name means black terror. So... How did that happen? I don't know. I mean, that theory that you just talked about is as good as any to explain it. But again, I would point to the fact that it, all humans are the same. We are all created equal. We all have red blood and we all go back to Adam. Okay. So I, I have, I see no difference other than size, shape and color in any human being on the planet. I am not, I don't have a prejudice bone in my body and I want to make that clear. Nor do I. But we, you know, I think some people are sensitive, so I have to be careful of how I word some of these things. But yeah, uh, if Nimrod's father, Cush, was named Black Terror, then there's probably a pretty good chance that he was a person of color himself, which does not in any way, you know, condemn people of color. I'm not saying that. We're just pointing things out here. So Nimrod, in Genesis chapter 11, it says that all of the people that were on the earth at that time, and these would be all the offspring of the three sons of Noah, had spread out together over the plains of Shinar, and gathered together under the leadership of what Dr. Michael Bennett calls the world's first transhuman super soldier, (laughs) Nimrod, and they had a little building project to create this thing called the Tower of Babel, which I would suggest had nothing to do with height whatsoever. Uh, People are like, well, you know, they're trying to build this big tower to reach up into the sky. Well, God didn't freak out when we built the Freedom Tower, the World Trade Centers, or the big one in Dubai, or anything else. Yeah, Sears I tower. agree. I agree. They were trying to reach the gods. They were trying to make a giant crystal. Right, or a stargate, what we would consider a portal that they could go through or in some way bridge the veil between this realm and the next. So, I mean, if they were concerned with height, they wouldn't have built it in a valley. <laughs> the plains of Shinar, they would have built it on a mountain. So I submit that they were building a stargate, essentially. And what's interesting about that story is God says, wow, whatever they imagine to do will not be restrained from them. So he goes down and confounds their language. Well, if you read some of the extra-biblical accounts uh, in what I call the synchronized 
biblically endorsed, extra biblical texts. These are texts that are not found in the Bible, but are referenced by the Bible. It says that Nimrod had divided the people up into three camps, and each camp had a different assignment. One was to assault the angels, one was to go in and kill God, and the other group was to set up their gods in the Holy of Holies. So they had a, a very evil intent with what they were trying to do when they, quote, reach into heaven. Are you familiar with the Large Hadron Collider in Very, France. Yes. My claim is I don't really believe they are trying to smash atoms. I don't think <laughs> yeah. they're trying to make the God moment. I think they're trying to make a modern-day Stargate. What do you yes. think? I 100% agree. You're the and first person that I've talked to that has even thought of that. Everybody yeah, else is, is buying their cover story, and I, I don't believe it. I don't think they've spent some $20 billion or something like that on this 17-mile tunnel. I don't only believe it. I've written about it, done DVDs about it. Because I, I look at Matthew twenty four thirty seven as it was in the days of Noah. But what most people I found don't think about is the fact that Noah lived 950 years, 600 before the flood, 350 years after the flood. So you have the hybridization taking place in the pre-flood world, but you have the creation of interdimensional portals in the post-flood world. And we see both happening in our day today with CERN and interdimensional portals and with scientists all around the world creating transgenic species, you know, transhumanism, blending species, exactly as it was in the 950 years of Noah's life. But when God confounded the languages, the byproduct of that was all these people who were serving under the leadership of one man, Nimrod, went away from the Tower of Babel talking about the same guy, but now in different languages. Come and find out what were the other names that Nimrod became known as, who were the gods that he became associated with, and why is that important, and how does that relate to us today? We'll continue with Rob Skiba tomorrow. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your prayers and gifts of support. God bless. Now from the Prophecy Club, some exciting opportunities for you. I debated Daryl Dumas for three hours, and I used 308 scriptures to show you that when the Bible says that the Lord descends from heaven with a shout, voice, trump, and dead rises, all these are describing that Jesus burns the tares and sinners at the seventh trumpet when all dead rise all the way back to Adam. Then we meet the Lord of the air and the angels rapture us to our mansions. Perhaps for the first time, without doubt, you will finally see that the pre, mid, and pre-wrath rapture theories are wrong. You will see scriptural proof that the post-trib rapture is accurate. This DVD may save your salvation. It will help you to never deny Jesus. It's the Rapture Debate Offer at 785-266-1112 or prophecyclub.com. That's 785-266-1112 or prophecyclub.com. This may help you keep your salvation. Lindsay Williams has done it again. He's come out with another awesome DVD, this one entitled Health Tips from the Elite. Did you know that no president of the United States has ever died from cancer? Why? What do they know that you don't? President Ronald Reagan was diagnosed with colon cancer when he was president. He imported a substance that was illegal to be used in the United States at the time. He never had a reoccurrence. There is no reason to suffer from cancer, heart disease, diabetes, chronic fatigue syndrome, multiple sclerosis, hepatitis C, hormonal imbalance, vascular disease, immunological imbalance. It's all in the new DVD, Health Tips from the Elite, not available on the Internet. you got to call 785-266-1112. That's 785-266-1112. Health Tips from the Elite. There are 30 scriptures in the Bible which say in the last days massive amounts of oil will be discovered in Israel and we believe we've been given the directive to use this prophesied oil and gas to fund worldwide soul winning. If you have questions about our vision, call 877-OIL-ISRAEL or 877-645-4772.